Hello and welcome to the Royal Horticultural Society's Chelsea Flower Show 2021. Well, we had to wait over two years for this very special event, but it's definitely been worth it. What a show it's been, Monty. It's been a good one, hasn't it? And, and of course, quite unlike any other Chelsea that you and I, who've been coming for a very long time, yeah. have ever seen. Yeah, there's a great vibe out there. Yeah. Everyone's having a really lovely... The weather's been incredible for the week. Couldn't have been better. Perfect weather perfect sense of celebration and, and lots of new things. I mean, yeah. things that have never featured uh, at Chelsea before. Yeah, I'll be really interested. I mean, the balcony gardens, there's a sanctuary gardens, the house plant gardens as well. Container gardens. Container gardens. So for small, for, you know, if you've got a small garden or no garden at all even, you know, there's still something here for you. And I, I think obviously the most obvious thing to any gardener is that there is a completely new palette of plants. Yeah. You know, the, the plants that we're seeing here and have enjoyed all week, almost are completely different to the range of plants that we've actually, to be honest, got rather used to yeah. in May. Well, people are learning new plants for this season, so yeah. I think that, that, that's a great thing too. I mean, and also there's an emphasis on, on you know, well-being. Yeah. Um, you know, in lots of respects, it's very important, of course. But I think that I think that you know, gardening more than ever has been it's been captured here to be as important as we all know it to be. And on top of that, if that wasn't enough, because that's quite a rustic thing, <laughs> sustainability in all its forms has been important, and an awareness of the natural world, because that's certainly over the last year or so, I think, yeah. has really opened up to people yeah. that your back garden can be a fascinating nature reserve. Yeah, I mean, also, there's some big subjects that they've dealt with here at the show, but it, it, it's not forced home. It's still just a great experience and it's a great fun. place to be, and, and you can take it on many different levels. Yeah, it's just been enjoyable. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah, it is fun. It is. Well, it is meant to be fun. <laughs> well, tonight we'll be bringing you the highlights of everything we've just mentioned and more. So let's get started. Coming up from the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2021, an event supported by M&G. We celebrate all things autumnal with a spectacular display of aces, a tree that really comes into its own in this season. And the passionate growers in the Great Pavilion are centre stage as Carol Klein and Francis Topil reveal some very special plants for this time of year. But we're starting with the gardens. There were six main show gardens this year that covered a variety of themes and subjects from inner city living to nursing and from as far afield as China and Russia. One gold medal winning garden that certainly caught my eye transported us to the magnificent Himalayas and the Kingdom of Nepal. The Trail Finders Garden, designed by Jonathan Snow, won a gold medal and deservedly so. 25 years ago, I spent 10 days uh, being a Sherpa for a BBC programme in the foothills of Annapurna. And the thing that struck me then, and that I remember daily, was just how beautiful it was. And the foothills, of course, are lush. You have this extraordinary richness of growth. And it's very wet, there's water flowing everywhere, the air is humid, it's warm. And so you get a mass of these wonderful plants. The rhododendrons, the persicaria, water running down through them. And that's what this garden captures. It exactly gets the spirit of that experience that I had so many years ago. And I'm sure anybody who has been to the Himalayas will recognize that. And the other thing that really strikes me about this garden that is instantly unusual and dramatic is this huge block of planting in the middle, which is bounded on one side by a stream and by a path. And that is really brave. Now, I've got Jonathan here with me in the garden. First of all, Jonathan, congratulations. Thank you, my Gold team. medal, Thank which you. is well deserved. You must be thrilled and exhausted. Very tired, yes. Yeah, <laughs> still tired. It's been a long, a long 22 days, but uh, over the moon, absolutely over the moon. There are a couple of things that, that I'm really interested in. The first is this immense planting mm. you have here. Was that something that happened naturally, or you suddenly thought that would be a good idea? Uh, I. I felt that it had to be quite full yeah. and lush. Um, what I didn't want was too much colour. Yeah. And I was telling my nursery three weeks ago, and I've apologised already, that I was worried about the lack of colour. In the yeah. end, too much colour turned up, and I turned it away. So I was 
happy for it to be full. And why, lush. why were you worried about too much colour? Because I wanted it to be representative of the landscape. Yeah. An evocation. I wanted to basically select the best parts of the landscape, distill them, then amplify them, but only in, not in terms of the colour, more right. in terms of just the, the, the overall feel. I mean, I notice none of the rhododendrons have flowers. They're all in bud, and yet we grow our rhododendrons for flowers. Exactly. That's pretty radical stuff. Well, uh, the RHS said to me, let's do a September show. Yeah. It's, it took me months to find these rhododendrons. So I initially said, no, my rhododendrons right. won't be in flower. I, I, this, is, this, yeah. is, this is very important. This is a spring garden. But actually, I'm really pleased they're not in flower. I think right. it would have overwhelmed the garden slightly. And what, what I think we've created are soft well, mounds of, of, you, of green. You've created a special garden. And Thank it's brought very, very happy memories back for me. And I'm sure will give huge pleasure. Thanks, Thank Martin. you. Showcasing life much closer to home in rural Somerset is the Yo Valley Organic Garden. We caught up with designer Tom Massey, who told us what inspired him to create a space that's both beautiful and good for the planet. I think I, I really look for the kind of the details, the way that light catches a leaf or the way that grasses sway and rustle in the breeze. As a garden designer, that's what I'm really looking for, those immaculate details. The soul of a garden, the, the kind of atmosphere that encapsulates the, the feeling and the spirit and the essence of the place. And I think what really attracted Yo Valley and, and me to, to work together was the idea of having a message or a theme or an idea uh, as a kind of core concept to a show garden. I love it here in the birch grove. It's so calming, so peaceful. The sound of the wind in the trees, it's just really meditative and calm and, and peaceful. This here is the garden design. This is a 3D model that shows the space and gives you an, an idea and a flavor. The back of the garden here is a woodlandy area inspired by this birch grove. So that's gonna give you dappled light. It's gonna give you the, the kind of glowing white bark. And in the middle of that woodland is this egg-shaped oak hide. So you can get inside here, winch yourself up and have an elevated view of the garden. As you move through the space, there's a stream that kind of connects the different spaces. So the design inspiration really comes from the different areas, the, the woodland area, the streams that run through the site, and also the wider Somerset landscape, you know, the kind of Mendip Hills, the really kind of natural feeling of, of this area and this garden. So the really special thing about this garden and the garden at Chelsea Flower Show is the organic ethos that underpins everything. People think of organic, they think wild, scruffy, messy, or they think food production. But this garden here is a really good example of an or ornamental garden that is organically certified and it is stunningly beautiful. And that is through the hard work and graft of Sarah Mead, who's the head gardener and the founder of this garden here at Yo Valley. So come and have a look at this, Tom. This border's got a bit crazy, but I'm quite liking it. <laughs> we've been here for a really long time. The family's farm for hundreds of years. And we've been farming here organically for just 26 years. And the garden has been in the, in the centre of the farm. And so, therefore, it made absolute sense, a no-brainer, that we should make the garden organic as well. This is the compost area of the garden. So this is really the engine room of the organic garden. We've got some really, really, really good stuff here. Look at that. There's a lot of worms in here. The principle of organic gardening is to get your soil really, really healthy, and then the plants or the vegetables that you put into that soil will benefit innumerably. They'll be tougher, they'll be stronger, and they'll be far more resilient. Here we go, Tom. Look. So pleased with it. Nice. That is compost plus grit plus biochar. Biochar is charcoal, basically, which is then incorporated into the compost as a kind of a really good way to improve the soil, to help its water retention, to retain nutrient. The biochar will feature in the Chelsea Garden as these kind of palisade walls of charred logs that sweep through the design. So this is what biochar looks like once it comes out of the kiln. So as you can see, it actually really catches the light nicely. It's going to create a really interesting structural, kind of artistic feature running through the garden. This is rain, yeah, this is Somerset. This is probably what it's going to be like in September in Chelsea. 
This Royal fan here was Munda Regalis, looking really nice actually. The, the team have done a great job, they've got some fresh growth there and these might even be taking on some autumn colour by September. So we're really hopeful that some of these plants will actually make it into the final show garden. I'm not saying the garden's not going to be good, you know, we're going for a gold medal, but it just becomes secondary. You know, the first and foremost, most important thing is that we are growing all the plants organically and that comes with a much higher risk. Not everyone's got the space or the, the time or the, the money to go for full organic certification. What we're trying to say is that small steps, small changes, if everyone makes a small difference, that will equate to a big change. Tom, what a lovely garden. It, it looks stunning, especially with the light just coming through the grasses and the rebeccas over there. It's brilliant. But yeah, we've just seen you at, at Yo Valley and you know putting the garden together. There's quite a lot of different elements I guess you have to try and include into the design here. How easy is that? Um, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily easy, but it's, there's so much inspiration there. It's, you know, you've got things like the stream, you've got the charred logs, you've got all the different yeah. planting, the and grasses, the birches. The birches. Well. Yeah, the birch grove, there's amazing. Yeah. So it's kind of taking little pockets of inspiration from that garden and translating it into my own take on that. Yeah, but you've got to edit stuff out, I guess, as well as put stuff in. Yeah, you've only got 10 by 15 metres, so it's not a huge space. So it's kind of, it's all about taking the, the highlights and then kind of reinterpreting, reinterpreting that yeah. and creating an organic feeling space. Yeah, I saw that there's those huge compost areas. I'm a bit jealous. That is serious composting going on there. Yeah. But an organic garden, how easy is it for people to have a beautiful garden like this and be fully organic? I think the thing is, it's just about being more patient. So it's not about rushing, it's not about seeing a pest or a disease and just blitzing it with chemicals. It's about being kinder to your garden and just thinking, you know, if you go away, if you leave it for a bit, some predator's gonna come and eat those aphids or something else is gonna, we've got a lizard actually living on the garden in, in the logs over there. So, you know, if you, if you create a garden that is kind to the environment, encourages biodiversity, that in itself is an organic principle and that will start yeah. to help the garden develop an ecosystem. Yeah, but you've also obviously thought about the planting, the design of it. I mean, once you've got that basis, yeah. you can put anything you want in, right, plant-wise, really? Yeah, I think that's it. it, doesn't, it organic doesn't just refer to fruit and veg. Organic refers to a principle and practice. So a simple organic principle is just to cut out the use of chemical pesticides or fertilizers. You know, make your own comfrey tea or use seaweed, or, you know, minimize your plastic use, recycle your plastic pots, yeah. conserve water. All these principles are simple principles that anyone can take. So if everyone takes small steps, it leads to big change. Yeah, well, this, this is inspirational. You got a gold medal, Tom. Congratulations, fantastic achievement. I know you're trying to get me and Monty in your egg at <laughs> some point this week. <laughs> we think, will come back, we will get in there. I think you got to, Joe. <laughs> well, well done. Cheers, thank you. A September show has presented us with a whole new palette of plants not normally seen at Chelsea. Francis Tophill and Carol Klein went to investigate late summer blooms and autumnal splendor in the Great Pavilion. As we leave summer behind, there is no reason why we should give up on colour in our borders. There are still plenty of late flowering blooms to feast our eyes on. Agapanthus are native to South Africa and they're often called Lily of the Nile, although actually they're not in the Lily family at all. But they offer such an amazing array of blues and whites at this time of year, which is quite rare because often late summer flowering plants are hot colours. So this is a really useful addition to any border. They grow so well in pots because they like having their roots restricted, so even in a small garden they can be very useful. But if you have the space, a sunny position will be perfect for them as well. They have very rhizomatous roots and form quite a mass of them, so after a few years you might want to divide them, which is best done in the spring. Some of these are evergreen and some of them die back in the winter, and some agapanthus even produce beautiful seed heads, so there is so much to choose from. Now this barrow just shows you the true range of colours that you can get from flowers at this time of year. But for me, the one that stands out the most here is this. It's Crocosmia, another native to South Africa, but with a very different feel and a very different colour, like this Emily McKenzie, with its burnt orange petals and a red throat. 
They're real performers. They flower for a really long time, right until the end of the autumn. This is another beautiful Crocosmia. This one's called George Davison, and it's much more delicate. You can see that these are in the iris family. They have very fine, strappy foliage, but these are corms, so they die right back in the winter, and then you can mulch them with compost or manure to feed them and protect them from the frost. In South Africa, these will grow in full sun, but in colder climates, they can cope with a little bit of shade. Once they've stopped flowering quite so much, which they will after a few years, just divide up those corms and replant them, and that should reinvigorate them. And right next to that is this. This is Heliopsis. It's called Fire Twister, and this one's actually brand new this year. It has purple foliage, which is absolutely glorious, especially against that beautiful burnt orange into red colour. If you want it to keep that real purpleness, it needs to be in full sun. But the lovely thing about Heliopsis is that they can cope with the toughest conditions. So bright sun, not a lot of moisture, and even really, really cold spots, and these will thrive. They can flower for six to eight weeks, just cut them back when they've done flowering or in the spring, and they'll come again every single year. So if you have a tough spot that's not too wet, these are your answer, and what could be more beautiful? Here. and through it you can see Rubachia prairie glow absolutely gorgeous that whole idea of these plants that mix and mingle but if you step over here and look through the same grass you get a completely different view there's this lovely aster little carlo and then that big lemon sunflower in the back but the grasses don't have to be American to work in a prairie planting as long as your plants get on together, that's the main thing. How wonderful that Chelsea's actually in the autumn this time, because that allows these grasses to really shine. They're at their very best right now. Look at this panicum. It's called Panicum virgatum rotstralbush. It means sort of red bush, and look at those dark red tinges to all the fronds and mixing and mingling so beautifully with all these North American daisies, plants of the prairie and brilliant pollinators. Lots of us are familiar with this plant, Vivina bonariensis. It's at its very best at this time of year and you see it with butterflies of plenty, it's glorious. So what is it that prairie plants need to help them thrive? Well, they don't need much, really. The requirements are minimal. What you mustn't do is overfeed them or give them soil that's far too rich. You want them to grow as they would grow in their natural habitat, jostling and having fun in the autumn sun. Autumn really is a beautiful season and it's the perfect time to see the ever-popular Japanese maple in all its glory. A few weeks ago we caught up with tree nursery and Acer specialist Larchfield to see if their Chelsea preparations were on track. Seeing them germinate you don't know what you're going to get and I find that after 30 years still very exciting in the spring when they're all bursting with colour and new growth. They're beautiful. 
30 years ago, I was given the gift of a bonsai and Neil killed it. Yes, and then for my birthday, you bought me a bonsai. And he didn't kill and it. Actually, I didn't kill. <laughs> and from there, we started selling bonsai. So we'd hire village halls and sell them. And then from there on came the maples. Well, the thing about maples, Japanese maples, is that they've got spring colour, they've got summer colour, and they've got autumn colour. But it is something that just gets hold of you. I'm still excited every spring to see them breaking into leaf. If you want to be successful in growing your Japanese maples, they need one important element, and that is oxygen to the root system. So tighten their pot, only repot to a slightly bigger pot, and if growing in the ground, you need old soil which is well drained. But the myth about them not liking the sun, some of them actually thrive and need the sun. The sun will give a lot of varieties vigour. There are some risks when you're trying to put on a display of maples in autumn. We could load them on the lorry, get to Chelsea and find that all the leaves are dropped off when we get there. Bearing that in mind, we thought we'd better incorporate another element, which are the Japanese umbrella pine. This is the Japanese umbrella pine, Skyadoptis verticillata. We're going to use them at Chelsea because they're evergreen. So if the maples don't actually come up to scratch, we've got the Japanese umbrella pines. We're doing it in collaboration with Dave Cheshire. So I think probably at this end, you could do with the bigger trees and perhaps kind of a cluster of, of maples. Yeah, if we do a little forest plant in here, you could do that, that would work well. What we think is going to be the showstopper is going to be the large Nawaki tree provided by David, and that should be something that will really catch the public's eye. So a Nawaki tree is basically a tree that has been trained in a way a bit like a bonsai tree, but in much larger scale, and they're intended to be grown in the ground as opposed to in a pot. And really they're designed to look like trees that have never been touched by man. They're designed to look like sort of stylized forms of, of what you'd find in nature, uh, sort of trees that are growing in mountainous regions and things like that. I think it's going to have real impact and it's something that's never been done at Chelsea before, which is very exciting. So we're pioneering. <laughs> I do have a little bit of apprehension about Chelsea, I think, one of the reasons why we haven't exhibited there before is because of the stress. But I think the fact that we're actually doing it with Dave has probably made me feel a little bit more relaxed about things. We've been exhibiting at RHS shows for 28 years. We've won two awards this year. We've worked together on the display at Hampton Court and at Tatton Park, and we've got a gold at both. We're hoping that Dave will be able to take it forward for the future. This is our first Chelsea, and because we're looking to retire from the shows, it will also be our last Chelsea. I mean, a gold would be lovely. It would be nice as our swan song to go out with a gold. People will say, well, I'm not bothered about a gold, but you are bothered about a gold, and that's all that really matters. But it's our last show, and we'll just enjoy it. Well, Neil and Kathy have bought the display here. Their stand is up and running and looking superb. And the thing that I love most about these maples is the way that when they're slightly moist, they just hold the drops of water and just quaver and slightly move with the weight of it. And even here in the pavilion, you do get that sense that a little breeze could just make the whole thing shimmer. Now, I have to say, I put my cards on the table, that although these look superb, my own attempts at growing Japanese maples have been mixed at best. So it was fascinating to see, really, that there are a lot of myths about them. The key thing is probably a soil that's ideally about 6.5 pH, but any soil but drainage, and drainage equals oxygen so that on my heavy soil at home, that's probably one of the main problems. And I'm certainly, when I see them here, inspired to have another go. And look how fantastic the Niwaki tree is. This is the Japanese yew. And I remember being in Japan, seeing these things individually picked out by hand on a huge scale. And to see this sort of halfway between bonsai and a real tree, exactly captures that Japanese spirit so well. And I, 
The two go well together. It's a good combination. I'm sure everybody who visits it will love it. Well, I'm very pleased to say that Neil and Cathy received a gold medal for their display, which was a fantastic result for their first and last Chelsea, which is a pity, but uh, because one well, would like to see more. But there's no question that going to Pavilion was a different experience this year. It, it was. was. Uh, and the honest thing is, when I went in there on Sunday, before anyone was there, it seemed a bit empty. But actually, as the week went on, I realised it was very nice to have that bit of extra space. Yeah. And I think people enjoyed that. Well, also, you know, is it a nursery, the nor you know, normally lots and lots of flowers. May, June, no problem at all. Yeah. Coming into September, you know, there's a limited amount of plants that are really going to, you know, flower at this time of year. Mm -hmm. But uh, things like ferns, you know, Kells Bay ferns just look absolutely stunning pretty much all year round. So there's some plants and the grasses in there yeah, were just well, drooled over yeah, those grasses. This, this is the season of grasses. Uh, and, and a stand that, I mean, I had to just admire, and I think everybody did, were Sienna Hostas. To have immaculate hostas at this time of year. Well, I went to see them yesterday. I said, how's it been? You know, how's your week been? And they said, if we have to answer one more question about slugs and hostas, we will just collapse They completely. must be used to that. They must be used to that. Uh, yeah, and Pheasant Acre Nursery as well. They do dahlias and uh, gladioli. I do the gladioli because I just think of Dame Edna. Um, but yeah, gladioli are back, Monty. It, I, well, I grow them myself. And, and it is fascinating how plants come into fashion and drop out. I mean, we've seen plants totally disappear. Who would have guessed Gladiola would be fashionable? They are back big time. Yeah. Right. Well, there's still plenty to come as we look back over our coverage from the week, including meeting a Chelsea first-timer as she prepared to exhibit her display alongside some of the finest florists in the land. I was on hand to meet the designers of the most coveted prize at Chelsea Flower Show, Best Showgarden. And there have been lots of firsts this year, so we take a look back at all the new garden categories making their debut, designed to inspire and admire. One of the big themes here at Chelsea has been sustainability and environmentally friendly gardening. There were lots of ideas and solutions on show that we can all take away and start to incorporate into our own gardens. Rachel Detain went to investigate how to get our gardens wet weather ready. There's no question that water in a garden looks beautiful and sounds wonderful. But it's equally important, particularly when we're concerned about lack of rainfall and at the other extreme, flooding. We need to think carefully about how to manage it in our gardens. We all have areas of hard landscaping in our gardens, whether it's the driveway or the patio in the back garden. Unfortunately, many of them are absolutely non-porous and we slap down concrete or paving stones without thinking about the water running off and just simply being lost. And so there are alternatives. Obviously, grass is a lovely surface underfoot, but not great to park the car on. Gravels and things like bark. But if you need something a bit more sturdy, this is a really good idea. You've got gravel here, but it's bound together with resin and yet it remains porous. You can see here the water just runs through this surface, which is rock hard, comes down through the stones, and it's collected in a reservoir, which is all hidden beneath the ground. And then that can run underneath any planting areas nearby. And what happens is there's a wick under here, and that draws the water up into the growing medium, and that means strong, healthy plants. I think it works extremely well, whether it's flooding you're trying to avoid or irrigation, saving every bit of that precious rainwater. Why have an ordinary tiled roof when you can have a green roof? Now, sedums are very popular on roofs. This one's also got a juga, it's got some provivum. I can see a bit of ivy up there. And they not only look good, but they're doing a great job because they are slowing the process by which any rainwater 
meets the ground. And so these plants obviously all benefit from the water themselves. And what I also love is that any overflow comes then onto this drain pipe. I love that it's transparent so you can see if there are any leaves collecting there, any blockages developing. And it goes down here into the water butt. And the water inside there that gets stored can be used to irrigate all the planting. And as a bonus, because there are those solar panels up there, the power from them pumps the water back up and creates this lovely water feature here on the inside of the walls. I think it looks good, it's doing a great job, and most importantly, not a drop of water gets wasted. This exhibit by Sparsholt College is dedicated to the great naturalist Gilbert White. In fact, he was born 301 years ago. And he lived not far from where I was brought up uh, in the village of Selborne. And his book, The Natural History of Selborne, has still had huge impact. In fact, influences people today. Because the point about Gilbert White was that he observed the natural world in great detail, but from his garden. The lesson he gave all of us was that you don't need to travel to understand huge amounts about the world about you. And as gardeners, if we use Gilbert White's example to meticulously observe what's going on around us, then not only can we benefit from it, but actually we can learn a lot that we can share with other people too. Gilbert White brilliantly observed what was going on in his garden. But what this section of the COP26 garden, which is called mitigation, shows us is not only must we observe, but we can act. We can do things to mitigate the effects of climate change and actually make things better. Now, there's a whole mass of things here, and it's worth going through them. First of all, know your soil. Is it chalk? Is it heavy clay? It will influence what you grow. And if you grow things that want to be there, they're going to be healthy. And really look at your soil structure, which is so important. So make lots of compost. Compost will improve the structure of the soil and the life of the soil. And everything gets better as a result. Now, what we have at the back here is a swale. A swale is a lovely word, but really it essentially means a ditch. So water, which is increasingly becoming a problem with these huge downpours we're having, instead of just being taken away to somewhere else, is actually slowed down and can be absorbed if you plant in it. And there are lots of plants that really love that rich, intense environment of wetness, or even a bog, and then it will fade away and they'll be fine. Make a pond, plant it up on the outside, so you have lots of diversity. You'll find that you'll be getting reptiles, you'll have bats, more birds, insects, mammals will come down, make a beach or step for them to get in or out. Plant a tree and shrubs. That will both sequester a certain amount of carbon, but also provide a fantastic habitat for birds, insects, mammals, and also a smaller flora to live in. And if you've got paving, leave gaps so the water can get out and plant them up. They look lovely. And finally, lots and lots of pollinating plants. Nice open shapes, daisy shapes, the rebecchias, the echinaceas, that can easily be accessible for pollinating insects. And if you put all this together, you don't just have a lovely garden. You are taking an active role in dealing with this crisis that we have to confront. And if we all do a little, then we can all achieve a lot. Positive signs of change aren't just restricted to what we do in our gardens. When it comes to floristry, Chelsea newcomer Lois Golding believes that where she sources her flowers from is just as important as the arrangement itself. Hi, I'm Lois. I'm the florist behind Little Garden Flowers, based in Warwickshire. We have a real mixture of clients. We sell flowers in local shops, but we have other people that want really ambitious wedding displays and uh, much more luxurious designs. So we try and cater to everyone and yeah, do a bit of everything. 
We grow on quite a small scale. We have tulips and dahlias, other bulbs, and then some annual cutting beds as well. We just try and fit in as much color and interest as we can, so we have a nice variety of flowers. I've always visited lots of RHS shows, Chelsea being obviously one of the most prestigious, so to actually be able to say I'm exhibiting is quite surreal because this is very new territory for us. Never really done anything like this before and yeah, well, there's been some pretty prestigious names in the floristry world that have previously done things like this. So yeah, it's really quite an honor to be one of those. I think we're one of seven others. It's quite exciting. The design's called Keepers of the Land. Here's a little miniature. We have uh, obviously the three different sections. So playing with representation in each of three very different spaces. Um, so at the back in this section here, it's supposed to represent a woodland. In the middle we have a wild meadow and then the front section is uh, a representation of like a cultivated space, so either a garden or a flower farm. It's a huge space. <laughs> uh, three by three meters square is a lot of space to fill. Everything's viewed through these sort of circular cutouts uh, with some mirrors sort of bouncing the light around at the back, which is supposed to create a bit of a sort of infinite view, especially when you're sort of stood here looking right to the back. The woodland, the wild meadow and the garden are all represented in my design aim to be put on a platform which they can share together and remind us how they all work on the same cycle. The concept behind the design is a opportunity to look at three different outdoor spaces and analyse and see what roles we can play in their conservation. Small things that we can do to make a difference can be as simple as letting your lawn grow long, making sure that you don't tarmac your front garden, or just planting some bee-friendly wildflower mix. I've always been an environmentalist since probably about the age of 13. So when I set up my business uh, in 2017, I decided that it was really important that those environmental choices were at the heart of what it is that I do. 90% of flowers bought in the UK come from Holland, and many are grown even further afield from places such as Ecuador, Kenya, and Israel. The carbon footprint of one flower stem can be as high as three kilograms of CO2. That's the equivalent of nearly 15 plastic carrier bags. If we buy British grown blooms, they are not only sustainable, but they are often better quality, stronger smelling, and grown by small independent business owners, like me. The majority of the time I'm using British grown flowers. I always use foam-free methods. Floral foam is the floristry equivalent of asbestos. It contains a complex combination of microplastics which do not biodegrade. Once soaked, it's flushed into our water system, which poisons marine life. As an alternative, I just keep it old school. Moss, compostable bags and twigs works just as well. Being at Chelsea is an honour. It's really special, it's exciting and a great place to show what we can create. It's a great opportunity, um, not only for people who are visiting, but also for people at home, learning about these issues of things that we need to start to change within the industry. So being able to have a platform to highlight the concept and, and talk about the story, as well as, you know, really dive into detail about the specific things we can all do to make things better is, is really, really great. The fact that we get to do that as well as exhibit at Chelsea Flower Show, it's, yeah, pretty cool. <laughs>
We've got dahlias in every single color and variety. And then the biggest crowd pleaser is probably the Mexican sunflower. I've had so many people who've commented on it. Yeah, he's been a real star of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Did you plan this for this time of year? Or was you going to be here earlier in May? Yeah, so it has had to change a little bit from the original plans. Um, it was planned for May, so we kind of had to freestyle a little bit. We decided to embrace the autumnal bold colors. <laughs> but it looks great, and I think actually the switch really, really works. Now, I know that you're really passionate about sustainability. Yeah, people don't realize, do they, just how much flowers can get flown around the world. It wasn't really until I got into floristry that I realised just what this crazy beast is, the global flower industry. You know, flowers are flown from abroad all the time and then they're shipped around the world. 90% of the flowers you buy in the UK are imported. It's really about just spreading a bit of awareness and making people um, aware of what we can get. You know, we don't need to be buying roses from abroad all the time when we have this much choice here in the UK. Yeah, I mean, it looks wonderful. And I think the thing is, is that the great thing about Chelsea is that not only can you tell a message, you can get a medal <laughs> and you've got a silver for your first time. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, how do you feel about that? It's incredible. I mean, the whole experience has been really quite surreal and, you know, so much thought has gone into really projecting the message behind the piece and using this as a platform to talk about important topics. And I almost forgot that we were going to be judged. So it's, um, it's yeah, to then actually get a, a, a silver medal is, um, yeah, pretty incredible for a first time. Well, good for you. And are you going to be back? That's a big question. We'll see. I might be able to make it happen in May if we're lucky. Never say never. That's what I say. Well, good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> With autumn in the air, it's a timely reminder to choose plants that will help wildlife through the coming cold months. Juliet Sargent gives us some great ideas on how to protect and encourage winter wildlife in our gardens. With autumn and winter approaching, things can often get a bit harder for the wildlife in our gardens. They often need to fatten themselves up and so with a little bit of thought, we can make things easier for them. This garden is a little bit untidy. This soft shagginess is so lovely for us to enjoy, but it's really good for the wildlife as well. Just look at this corner of the garden tucked away, it's almost as if it's been forgotten, but that's exactly what the wildlife need. Somewhere where they can forage for nesting materials. A native hedge like this is just perfect for the little animals to be able to run through as a safe wildlife corridor. The birds can collect the seed heads and also, during the winter months, they'll eat lovely fresh berries like these on this native hawthorn tree. It's absolutely perfect spot for them. Of course, as a garden designer, I love a design detail. And these charred logs are very Chelsea. But there is a serious point to them as well. If you have log piles like this in your garden, then the wood lice, the beetles and creepy crawlies can inhabit all the nooks and crannies. And there is a rumour around the show that there is a lizard somewhere in these log piles, but I haven't seen him yet. We can't all have a spectacular water feature like this, but if you can find space for a small pool or even a bird bath, then that'll provide the essential water that birds and insects and mammals need over the winter months. But the problem is that in the winter, the surface of the water can freeze over. So if you just get hold of a tennis ball and pop it in the water, it'll bob about and that'll stop the water freezing over. Now, traditionally, gardeners have always thought that the best thing to do is tidy up the garden at the end of the summer. But now we know that the wildlife rely on us to be a little bit messier in our gardens. In fact, a messy gardener is a kinder gardener. Chelsea's top prize, the RHS Best Show Garden, went this year to a design that had sustainability and nature right at its heart. 
I joined Sue Biggs, the Director General of the RHS, on the, the Huang Zhao Garden, designed by Peter Schmiel and Chin Yung Chen. You've won a gold medal. Your first Chelsea. I mean, obviously, you're delighted. Did you expect it? No, we are really delightful. Really? And, and, and it's a privilege being here, to be honest, to participate. Well, I think it, it is a wonderful garden. And there is not just gold medal. Peter, but... I hate to interrupt oh. you. Sorry, Monty. <laughs> That's all right. But I am so over the moon to say that the Guangzhou Garden has won the best show garden at Chelsea 2020. Oh, wow. <laughs> Your garden has so much soul, it's so beautiful. Right. <laughs> now, Peter and Chin, obviously you're, you're overwhelmed with your success. <laughs> but, but, but let's get back to the heart of the garden. What's the story behind this garden? What does it represent? Well, it's inspired by Guangzhou City between mountain and water. But it was, represents really a reconnection of ourselves with nature and how nature can heal, help heal the planet really in many ways. And the basic concept is a green lung at the back of us. So th this is the green lung here? Green yeah. lung. OK. So it's cleaning the air, benefit for nature and people. That then flows into the space directly behind me, the social heart, gain reading. And this enormous... Now, why that shape? Why have you, why have you taken that, sh that pod-like shape? Yeah, we are kind of try to find the exp um, inspiration from the nature. So we are looking at like a butterfly egg, uh -huh. and then that like, have the form, and then we want to have like also like the pa random pattern. But we the kids in they need to like see through, to, right. so you feel the connection. And, and what does the water represent? So that represents the blue kidney. So it's about cleaning, purifying that water through there. Right. And we've used a great range of aquatic plants right. to do that, and mm -hmm. this time of year it's really good for aquatics. So so, so this is the body exemplified incredibly beautifully. Everybody loves it. You've won a gold medal and you've won best show garden. Yeah. Does life get any better? Doesn't yeah, no. feel like it. It's really, really on high at the moment. Yeah, really yeah, excited. It well, congratulations. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. There have been so many new things to enjoy at this year's show, not least several new categories including the exciting balcony gardens. Garden designer James Smith is a newcomer to Chelsea but has some form when it comes to creating pocket gardens in the sky. City centres, particularly London, very busy places. There's a lot of green space around but public green space. People don't always realise that there are other private green spaces in and around the city and that's quite often up on the roof. My name is uh, James Smith, um, I'm a landscape architect and garden designer. I've uh, been designing gardens for the last 16 years. It's my first time at Chelsea this year designing a small balcony garden. I designed this uh, rooftop garden in the centre of London. This garden was designed um, as a private residential space away from the busy city below. It's a minimal garden designed to have uh, an area for relaxation, for entertaining and just to enjoy the views that the city has to offer. There are lots of things that need to be considered when you're planning a roof garden. They're quite extreme environments. The microclimate on a roof terrace is a lot different to your normal garden. So you have extremes of wind, of rain and of sun, so plants have to be resilient to that kind of conditions. On the roof garden here we've got agapanthus. Agapanthus is a good plant to use in a roof terrace environment. They're up against the building slightly as well, so it gives a bit more protection from wind, um, stops them from getting battered about too much. At Chelsea this year I've designed a small balcony garden. It's only five by two metres. In my garden there are a number of key elements that make up the design. So I've cloaked the whole of the terrace floor of the balcony in planting, something that's a little bit unusual for that type of space. And I'm looking to also to entice the senses by having elements such as sculpture, feature pots and subtle lighting as well. This building in the city has a very special roof garden designed for nature and biodiversity. It even has its own ecologist, Mark Patterson, who oversees the site. 
Wow, what an amazing roof garden. Fantastic space for biodiversity. This is a, it's a, it's an 11 floor green roof. It was installed about 12 years ago as a sedum carpet. And over the years, about 70 species of flowering plant have sort of self-colonized the roof. And in addition to the things that have spontaneously colonized the roof themselves and assisted, we've been plug planting the roof and seeding the roof with a range of wildflowers to create more nectar and pollen for, for pollinating insects. For my own garden at Chelsea, I'm just looking to use uh, some quite you know, roof, green roof tolerant plants. I've, I've looked at weaving some sedums in amongst some of the planting, but I was just wondering what you suggest for other perennials perhaps that I could use within yeah. the, in the garden. If you've got um, deep enough soil, um, Eryngium sea hollies, um, oh, yeah. they've really thrived up here and they're really good at drawing in the smaller solitary bees, the Lassie glossum and the yellow face bee. This is uh, Sinfoin. Um, this is a, a perennial wildflower, member of the pea family. And this has done really well in the roof. It's thrived in the dry conditions. It naturally grows in dry habitats within soils, mm. um, but it's very drought tolerant. And it's also a superfood for bees. So it's really popular with bumblebees and also with the honeybees. The roof garden on top of the building is amazing and lots of inspiration for my own garden with regards to nature and increasing biodiversity. But further down the building, on another level, there's actually another really interesting space that I'd like to go and have a look at. So I'm looking to use some nice scented plants within the balcony garden just to help with the senses and you know have that lovely feeling when you go into the garden, you brush past something that's highly scented. It's a great planting combination to have a look at here as well. We've got the Erigeron, uh, Mexican fleabane is the common name. It's a lovely, cheerful plant and does great in extreme conditions. Grows in little crevices and billows out over the side of uh, planters as well. So I'm hoping to use that within my garden. Also, plants like lavender are also great. Got a Mediterranean style of planting and everybody loves the smell of lavender as far as I know. Gardens would be great for wildlife, lots of benefits for ecology and nature, bringing in pollinators into the space, but they also have to work well for the individual as well. And I'm really trying with the balcony garden to improve people's mental health and well-being. And the balcony, although small, it hopefully demonstrates that anything is possible, even in the tightest of spaces. And here I am on the finished garden with designer James, who really has showcased how you can elevate your balcony to great heights. And it's extraordinary. I mean, how many plants have you packed into this space? We've tried to maximise every last inch of it. Um, yeah, really just to showcase how you can uh, maximise every part of your small garden. Um, it, just because it's a balcony doesn't mean that you can't experiment with different plant combinations. And how did your visit to the Numero Sky Garden, how did that filter through into the finished finished I think here. at Nomura it was very interesting to see the mix of plants that they have up there and also there were edible plants woven in with normal planting and lots of scented plants as well so to attract bumblebees uh, so the Nepita was one that actually was a favourite there that the bumblebees absolutely love so we've got some of that on the corners but also some lower growing varieties as well running through. Um, I did have some Eryngiums originally planned as well um, because we saw them on the terrace and they were doing very well uh, however the flowers decided to fade just before the show so we we haven't got those in unfortunately. Never mind, I don't think they're missed. No. And the original one's beautiful, just <laughs> spilling you. over the edge of the pot there. I also absolutely love how you've got the edibles growing in the pots on the wall. Yeah. yeah, again, it was just to show another element to the garden, a bit more sort of diversity for everyday use. So you could interchange these pots very easily. If the herbs are fading over time, you could just pick some up in your local supermarket or the garden centre and pop them in. Um, and they're easily reachable uh, and easily to maintain. They do require a bit more water. Uh, because they're smaller pots they would tend to dry out but you have got a little bit of shade cast from the arbutus trees here as well. Yes you've really managed to create that sort of microclimate feel here. What tips would you give to gardeners who've got a similar sort of space to make the absolute best of it? I think just to try and sort of challenge yourself a bit really with the space and don't be afraid of experimentation as well. So the planting here has been designed so there are lots of different species. So if one is not looking particularly great and it starts to fail, you can easily pop it out and try something new. Um, and I think I try to get the plant as close to you as possible as well. So the bench, you can sit down and you can then interact with the plants as well. So not so much thinking out of the box, thinking out of the balcony. Exactly, yes. <laughs> I'm going for it. I think it's an absolutely beautiful garden. Thank you. And exceptional what you've done with something of this size. Thank you, James. Thanks very much. Congratulations. Thanks. 
Also new for 2021 are the container gardens. They're packed with ideas for city dwellers and urban living, and they're all about maximizing the potential of your outdoor space. Adam Frost went to investigate the design inspiration in these small but perfectly formed gardens. This container category, for me, is a great addition to Chelsea. They feel attainable. Think about it, you know, you've got an area outside, you can't dig down into the ground. Maybe you're renting, you want to pick something up, take it with you. You've got a balcony, so yes, it's about small space. But they're great. This one's designed by Ellie Adkins, and it's inspired from time spent in Cornwall. You imagine you're a city dweller and you want to bring some of that coast home with you. Straight away, the materials sit comfortably together. If you look at that back wall, it's just corrugated sheeting, but it's been sprayed, updated, given a new lease of life. That connects well with these containers down here. Over in the corner, this is a lovely little shower, and it's fun, but look at the detail in the tiles. But the plant in itself is for a shady space, so you don't get lots of colour jump out. It's cool, shady, moody, but it relies a lot on shape and form and texture. And it does what it says on the tin. the boulder is set at 91 degrees to help with the celebration of the moon festival which funny enough is on the 21st of September and I think that is very poignant considering this is probably the only time we're going to have a Chelsea in September. Indoor planting in all shapes and sizes has been growing in popularity over the last few years and it seems like the house plant has never been so fashionable. We sent Nick Bailey to learn more about this house plant revolution. Welcome to the house plant studios. Some of these spaces have been created to mimic rooms in our own home, such as a bathroom or study, where others just got wild with creativity. This space is known as the green room and it's fantastically lit in lime and pink. And there's an, even a mirror ball up there, which kind of reminds me of my own garden. Now, it's all about creating a jungle vibe in here. And all of these hanging plants, I think, do that extremely well. They almost feel like those lianas that you see in the rainforest. And two plants that work brilliantly in these hanging containers are these just here. This is Nepenthes. It comes from the rainforest from Southeast Asia and it needs quite a moist environment so it's going to do well in a kitchen or a bathroom. It needs to be regularly misted to keep it happy. And then beside it here is this Medanilla with its huge pink flowers. When you buy it, it's nearly always in blue and you get many, many months of colour. I really like the setup over here. It sort of feels like an apothecary's lab, and it's demoing one of the relatively recent innovations in houseplant growing, and that is this LED light system. What's extraordinary about it is it means that you can grow virtually any plant anywhere. It gives you a complete spectrum of light, and it hardly uses any electricity. 
This is the forest in your home studio, and it's all about creating that sort of rainforest vibe. And plants like this, of course, come from that environment. This is Ripsalis, which is a type of rainforest cacti. This little Tillandsia basically absorbs ambient moisture and mist, and you can just literally hang it on anything and it will grow away. And then underneath is this more typical looking bromeliad, and it gets its water in a totally different way. That rosette of leaves effectively creates a little pool which holds water and trickles down into the plant. So you can mount it onto cork, you can put it onto a wall. Sometimes in the wild, you can find little baby frogs living in the center. Further back in this forest space, there's some room for orchids. And of course, many of the orchid species do come from rainforest environments where they're epiphytes, so they're hanging on to the side of trees. And the ones that we've all been growing for years and years and years are the Phalaenopsis, like this. Very easy to grow, they can be suspended or they can grow in bark in a container. And so you can see between these two different spaces, completely different vibes, but it proves that houseplants really can work in absolutely any space. The Great Pavilion has seen its fair share of nurserymen and women blossom into iconic names within the horticultural world. But the one thing they all have in common is that they had to start somewhere. This year's no different, as two new kids on the block made the leap into the big time with their very first flower show display here at Chelsea. We've all realised over the last year and a half that we've spent a lot of time in our houses and I think having plants and something to kind of nurture and care for is really good for your mental health. My name's Jacob James and this is my first ever display at Chelsea Flower Show. I've been collecting tropical house plants seriously for probably about two and a half years. I started to see them as kind of an experiment, so oh, I wonder if I could grow this plant or this plant, or I wonder what happened if I increase the humidity with these plants, and then suddenly it became a, a big wormhole where the whole flat was full of plants. What kind of marks someone as a collector is probably someone who, who wants to go beyond just picking up a plant off, off the shelf in a store and, and buying it because it looks nice. For myself, it was, you know, researching the, the habitats of where these plants live, customizing maybe the soil that they're in or the light requirements, and then also just trying to find kind of rare and more unusual species, maybe some that, you know, nobody else has in, in the UK. The highlight of my collection at home is this Monstera. The reason I, I love it so much is not just the, the sheer size and kind of the impact that, that it has in a room, but also the, the story behind the plant. I actually got this from a guy who, whose wife had, had sadly passed away. And the, the plant was actually a gift to her from her father when she was 18. Um, so it was almost 50 years of age at the point where I, where I got it. I think it just highlights that the plants can, can have a history and can be part of your life. I started to import plants for kind of my own collection to get plants that I just couldn't find in the UK. And just to kind of cover the costs, I added a few more to the order so I could sell to kind of other collectors. And the first one I did kind of sold out, the second one I did sold out. So I just kept doing it. And then suddenly it got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to take this seriously. It's now like a full-time job. I've got like a thousand plants to, to look after. So I was really looking for a, a partner and that's when I, I met Otto and, and we both had the same interest in, in rare plants and we kind of came together and decided to, to really grow the business. Our reputation is built on our sustainability. It became very apparent during Covid that a lot of plants were being stripped from the wild for profit and we wanted to reduce our impact within the UK as much as possible. So we started growing a large percentage of our plants from seed or from cuttings that we, we take from our mother plants. And our aim is to hit 70% by the end of 2021 of all our plants coming from our own propagations. When we decided to apply for Chelsea, it wasn't so much of a kind of serious idea. We thought that, you know, there's no chance that 
in our first year that we'd be able to exhibit and they said they loved our idea. It was, it was, a, it was a surprise, let's put it that way. So this display is a 1.2 metre cube that will have glass sides and, and a top. And it's essentially a recreation of a, a slice of the Amazon rainforest. So this is at least four times the volume of the biggest terrarium that most people will have in their home. We have a, a Warakwianum, which some people like to grow as a house plant, but we're showing how it would naturally grow in its native environment. We've got a, a water feature in here, and, and what I was essentially trying to replicate was uh, sort of a, a stream running through a, a rainforest, and you've got maybe a, a huge ramp mound of rock and a few epiphytes growing off of it, and we'll have mosses and aquatic plants growing in the water. It's pretty heavy with all the rock work, the glass. It's around about one tonne. We're really excited to show people exactly what you can do in, in the confines of a small home. I'm really excited. I think it's, it's suddenly pulling the, the whole design together. Yeah, and I'm just excited to, to hear other people's opinions as well at Chelsea. And here we are on Jacob Anotto's stand. And wow, I mean, it's been a bit of a whirlwind for you. I mean, you, you created the business in lockdown and a few months later, you're at Chelsea. Exactly, yeah. I mean, Jacob started this essentially as a bedroom business yeah. back in April 2020. Yeah. But it really kicked off when I joined and we built a greenhouse inside a unit and uh, joined our collections together. And that's when we really started. It looks stunning. I yeah. love the way you set it up, like a, a sort of piece in an art gallery. It's so well Thank lit you. as Thank well. You. Yeah, I mean, well, that, that was the intention. It was just really to create a naturalistic un, you know, view of what we, you would get in the rainforest, yeah. but really light it in a dramatic way that really draws the, draws yeah, the attention. Yeah, and you can walk all the way around it, which is great. Yeah. Now, has the response been positive? I guess it has. Yeah, the response has been amazing. I think people are used to seeing small terrariums, but this is like maybe the first time they've seen something on this scale. Yeah. And just really showing what's possible yeah. within a terrarium. And you've got some pretty rare plants in here, haven't you? Yeah, so I think probably all but two of them. It's probably the first time that they've even been at Chelsea. Um, and only a handful of people, even in Europe, grow them. Yeah. Um, plants like Anthurium clydomoides, um, Monstera obliqua, um, incredibly sought after and really hard to source. OK, because, I mean, yeah, poaching in the wild, most of us, you know, go and buy a house plant. We don't really know where it comes from. But you guys do know where it comes from and how important it is to, to source them properly. Exactly. Well, I mean, with, especially with COVID, people buying houseplants, the demand has gone way up. So even plants that are quite common in cultivation have started to become poached in the wild. So we make sure we have a full trail of where we're getting plants from, from when we're, from when we're importing. But we, uh, we propagate 70% of our plants in our, in our nursery in the UK. So yeah. we can be certain that that's sort of helping at least. It's really important and I mean it's a beautiful, it, it's great. I just hope the business takes off and you, and you guys do really well. You've got a silver medal, congratulations. Thank you very much. And I'll see you again in spring, right yes, here. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Those guys are really interesting. You know, I think they've created something very special there and house plants, you know, are back but it's interesting they source them and they grow from seed over here as well. So, um, well, there's no it question that houseplants have become the biggest story in gardening. Yeah. I mean, the houseplant explosion is, is not an And we remember them back from the, in yeah. the 70s, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and they just went totally out of fashion for a while. But that idea of sustainable sourcing is very interesting because we all know that most, a lot of houseplants come from all over the world. We, we like that about them. Yeah, but when you buy them, you never quite know exactly no. where they're coming from. But, you know, and also people can garden. A lot of people haven't got garden, they haven't even got a balcony, no. but they can still grow plants indoors. Well, I have seen some amazing space. And what I love about houseplants is it's a younger generation, really taken to them. Yeah, and if you're renting a place, you can always take them with you. Yeah, you can. Well, it's great to see that in such a difficult year for so many people, there have been lots of positive stories. So, still to come on our review of the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2021, an event supported by M&G. We revisit another very timely new category for this year, the Sanctuary Gardens, designed with calm and well-being in mind. I met up with the actor David Morrissey, who took a break from his own vegetable garden during a bumper harvest for a look around Chelsea. 
And Adam Frost lived up to his name with his guide to the design features that transform your garden into a warm, welcoming space this winter. Another key theme across the show this week has been how gardening and nature can improve our health and mental well-being. One garden that personifies the challenges of the pandemic was the Finding Our Way NHS Tribute Garden by designer Naomi Ferret cohen And earlier in the week, I got the chance to have a good look around. Now, the Sanctuary Garden really encapsulates the turbulent 18 months for us all. It's the Finding Our Way NHS Tribute Garden by designer right. Naomi Ferret cohen And it's a beautifully designed little space, a sunken garden, so you really feel as if you're in amongst it. This pergola is beautifully built. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I love the two seats either side where people can gather and talk to each other. It's a very sociable space but you can hear water throughout this garden. The water starts by trickling down the outside of the pergola into a couple of pools, and then it runs down these gorgeous rills into this pool at the bottom, the elliptical pool, and the sound of it is just right. Water, when it's too loud, can be dominant in a small space like this, but it works beautifully. Then we've got the planting, a mixture of dahlias and nithophias and grasses, uplifting planting. And being a sociable space, you sort of want to, you want to feel energised by a garden and it works absolutely beautifully. Well, this garden came about when Naomi joined forces with a friend from a very different walk of life, whose experience on the front line during the pandemic helped inform the design. My name is John Freighter and I'm a professor of infectious diseases at the University of Oxford. My day job is to run a research group where we study new therapies for HIV and immune responses, so how one might make a vaccine when COVID struck. I got a call to come and help and, and run one of the general COVID wards at the John Radcliffe Hospital up the road here in Oxford and basically everyone came together within the NHS. You know, from the doctors to the nurses, pharmacists, porters, kitchen staff, and despite everything else that was going on and the horror of what we were seeing with COVID, by pulling together, um, we could get everyone through this. And in particular, I think that is kind of where the NHS is so amazing. There was a feeling that somehow we had to sort of recognize, mark what was going on. So back in 2018, we'd done a garden at Chelsea about HIV, and there'd been a really amazing response. The question was, could you do a garden about COVID? You know, the first person I wanted to talk to was Naomi. So during the pandemic, I felt very privileged to be able to walk up here. We've got the South Downs here, and then you can see um, Brighton over here. In the midst of um, what was going on with coronavirus and family life, I was homeschooling and working. I get a phone call from John, and he said to me, do you want to do a show garden? I said, well, yes. And then I said, what would it be about? And he said, the coronavirus. And I thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is a huge subject to be talking about. So um, yeah, let's talk a bit more and come up with some ideas. I'm really looking forward to see John. Um, it's been a while since we've seen each other. We've had lots of Zoom meetings online. So to see him face to face will be really lovely. <laughs> Naomi, hi, how are you? Hi, John, great to see you. <laughs> it's been ages, hasn't it? It's, it's been, been too long. Been... I know. I know. No, it's been I a know. crazy year and a half, really, hasn't it? Really it really has. So this is the design for the Finding Our Way NHS Tribute Garden? Yeah, yeah. Um, Amazing. Let's hope you like it. It looks incredible. Oh, thank you. That first initial fear is represented in, in the... I've got the big structures, and it felt like you were sort of standing on the edge of, like like looking down and what was going on with coronavirus and it was really quite scary for everybody. I really love the pools and how they sort of link everything together. Yeah, well that's the representation of people coming together mm -hmm. to try and help that one cause um, for the NHS. But also we wanted the garden to feel like it was a relaxing space, a time to reflect on what mm. has happened. And I think that's really important. Yeah. Isn't it?
This is crazy. It's like a jungle, Naomi. I know, I know, but it's so, great, isn't it? It is great. So, look, you know I'm completely clueless. Yes. Tell me, are these some of the plants we might be using in the garden? Yeah, so we're here at um, Sussex Prairies. This is my lo one of my local gardens that come to, and okay. I brought you here so you can actually see some of the plants that we'll be using. We'll be using things like salvias because they okay. bring this a is nice. A salvia. Yeah, it's All a right. lovely salvia. It brings lovely height. The mixture of the grasses the uh, echinaceas and the asters all together. And that brings the soft tones that I was talking about. And they sort of sway in the wind. You see how soft it is. And it's just, that's the sort of feel that we're, we're trying to create in uh, Chelsea Garden. My hopes for Chelsea are that people will understand the message. They'll get to have a space where they can reflect and that we actually bring a garden together that people enjoy. This is a tribute garden to the NHS. The thousands and thousands of people, you know, from doctors and nurses, pharmacists, porters, kitchen staff, everyone who's come together in the last 18 months, you know, and given time and, you know, lives in some cases. I mean, this is really important and it's made a huge impact on everybody. You know, if there's one message that comes out of this garden, it's that massive thank you to everyone who's worked in the NHS to sort of get us through what we've got through. Another Chelsea garden that offers a place to re-engage with nature and feel mentally restored is the Psalm 23 garden. Francis Tophill caught up with the legendary Chelsea designer Sarah Eberly to find out more. So Sarah, congratulations. Gold medal. <laughs> Thank you, I'm so pleased. Tell me about the concept behind this design though, because it's, it's so striking. This garden is about, in the main, the line in the psalm, he restores my soul. So it's about a restorative garden, it's about a tranquil garden. It's a garden of healing, one could say. And it's certainly, I would say, a pause. When you sit on this rock, which is the destination rock, yes. and you close your eyes, you are in that place. You're sitting for a moment beside a stream on a boulder in an auspicious place. You have fitted an awful lot <laughs> <laughs> in this space. How on earth have you managed this huge amount of construction? You can't order a rock two metres by 450 so I had to go and select them all so that they're approximately what I want. The main rock, which is seven and a half tonnes, the one the water comes over, that I, I actually had to go and visit twice. And then it's my job to make sure it goes together when we get here. So quite a lot of pressure. And this isn't just ending its life here. This is being built after Chelsea when all this is over. I would be very disappointed if this garden didn't have an afterlife. So this garden is going to Winchester Hospice, a fabulous home where it can impart some of this tranquility and peace to patients and patients' families. Well, I certainly think it's very inspiring and I feel inspired to just sit here for as long as I possibly can and soak up a bit of this calmness. I think I'm going to join you for a while. <laughs> Now I'm here with an award-winning actor you might be a bit more used to seeing with a furrow brows a young Gordon Brown in The Deal or, or marching into battle as Roman conqueror Aulus in Britannia. But I'm pleased to welcome here in his role as a gardener the actor David Morrissey. Well, you are a gardener now, aren't you? I'm very new, yeah. yeah. I don't know whether I can take on the mantle yet, but I am, yeah. I actually think that one of the, the great things about gardening is the minute you start, that's it. Yeah. You're in. Yeah, very much you know. so. It came to me late, it did. I moved house and I was on my own with a garden. and I thought, oh. what am I going to do? And I started slowly getting into it and thinking, OK, and then COVID happened. Yeah. And that gave me the time to sort of see it develop and really spend time in there and sort of see how the difference I could make. It's been a real revelation for me, actually. Really. What, what were the particular things? 
Well, well just, yeah. the, I mean, just the simple things, like I, I bought seeds, I planted them into little pots. I don't have a greenhouse, but my garden has a lot of sun. Mm. I, put, I saw them shoot up and then I put them in the garden and then I watched them grow and I was thinking, I did that, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, the results are not up to me, but the sort of the, keeping, keeping on top of everything, I love that. I love the meditative side of it. I love the hard work side of it. I love yeah. being outside. I mean, in a way, it was such a... I'd been quite prejudiced about gardening for years in some way. I felt in what that, way? You know, well, I felt that there was some sort of pipe and slippers moment, yeah. that as soon as you went into the garden, that was it, you know. Yeah. I was so work-obsessed that it was taking time out didn't seem real to me. It felt like a waste of time. And in the last couple of years, I've discovered just how, what it gives me back. Just, yeah. uh, it's quite a singular thing to do. But it can be communal as well, you know. And today, I mean, what's been wonderful about being here, and I've never been here before, is just the amount of ideas you walk away with, the amount of different gardens you see. It's been really a revelation to me. Is there anything in particular that's good? Cool? Well, I saw the Forge Garden, which yeah. I really liked. I yeah. thought that was wonderful. And Branscombe's a part of the world that I know, so that was interesting. But also in the pavilion, I went in and saw the, the cactus stalls, which... I've sort of fallen in love with, I have a cactus in my home, which I love, and few actually. So that was wonderful to see the flowering cactuses. And I've just recently cleared out a couple of beds at home. So I'm looking at the roses for climbing and right. stuff. But I also have raised beds. So I did get a lot of envy when I was in the pavilion and I saw all the, all the veg and hook. Goodness, how do you do that? I think it's quite bad for you to go and see the veg <laughs> yeah. here, actually, because because they they are so impressive. Oh, it yeah. is. I yeah. mean, I could I couldn't believe they were real at first, yeah. you know. Yeah. But yeah, so it's all and I, you know, I've got my home produce that's come through, potatoes and carrots and all those yeah. things. So it's been real. It's been a real joy, actually. And obviously, in the year that we've had, which has been so hard for so many people, mm. I was just so grateful every day that I had some space, and that I was able to sort of focus on it, you know, it's great. I mean, I think the, the aspect of mental health, well-being, call it what you will, is something that has blossomed. Yeah. And clearly it's worked for you, hasn't it? Yes, but in a very surprising way. I wouldn't think of that. As I said, I always thought that going into the garden was slightly akin to retirement. Yeah. And being able to go in, and now <laughs> it sounds so strange to say, but I miss it when I'm away. I sort of think about it in a way that I think, oh, I'd like to get back and do this, I need to do that. Yeah. And, I, you know, I still do talk a lot about football with people at work, yeah. but now we talk about gardening as well. And I thought, it, I thought it, of it as middle class, I yeah. thought of it, all those prejudices that people yeah. know. And then I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to get into it. And it's been a real revelation, as I said, and long may it continue. Well, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Well, thanks. It's my pleasure to meet you and to be here as well. Thank, thank you. you. I think it was very interesting that David Morrissey said that he resisted gardening for quite a long time because somehow he felt that it was A, a middle-class activity and B, middle-aged and he, he would lose his, his youth. Oh, of course, you know, he laughs about it because he loves it now. But one of the things that I personally really care about with gardening is that it does away with all that. It's yeah. for everybody. It doesn't matter what class, colour, race, creed, age. age, anything. It's for everybody and it's democratic. I totally agree with you yeah. and that's one thing I love about it as yeah. well. And, and younger people are getting into it. So yeah. I think it's just that he's middle-aged and middle-class. That's why <laughs> he's coming from his angle. But, you know, we can see all sorts of people here and um, gardening cuts right through that. And long may that last and, and long may we all just think, welcome everybody into the gardening family. I mean, everybody, you know, is, should take part. And the more we have, the better we all benefit. Yeah, but also, you know, the guys who put the show on here, the nursery men and women and the landscapers and the designers, there's a, there's a big range of people who, yeah. who get involved here as yeah, well. You really right. see it here, that don't you? Absolutely true. Now, all week, Adam Frost was on hand to give us take-home design advice to help plan our gardens for next spring and summer. But as the curtain falls on this unique Chelsea, and we begin to look forwards towards winter, Adam gave us some great ideas on how we can all enjoy our gardens through the colder months too.
Hey, the nights are starting to draw in and we're gonna retreat indoors. The fires are gonna go on, rugs will come out and we'll probably start watching even more TV. So I'm thinking tonight on take three, we're gonna work out how we can get a little bit more out of our gardens over the winter months. And this, the Florence Nightingale Garden, is a good place to start. I think the first point, getting more out of your garden through the winter months has got to be the lighting. There's a silver birch just down there and it's uplit. It's got leaves on it at the moment and they're going to come off over the next few months. But the lighting just brings the whole tree alive. Here, in front of me, that looks beautiful with the reeds back against that wall. That could be a garage wall. You could have lighting through with planting in front. It could be part of a journey back to the house. So work out how it affects your everyday life and then you want to work out how it makes you feel. Remember as well, with the lighting, it doesn't all have to be fixed. Just these lovely little candles set around a scene for a cosy, romantic cup of cocoa in the garden. And I think the next thing has to be a destination point. And look at this arbor. I mean, it's, it's a piece of art. But even a sort of semi-covered area tucked away down the garden that you can disappear to, that's just peaceful. You can have a moment. But the clever thing as well is just these lovely little slots you can look up. Here, you're looking up into trees and the leaves are moving. But it could be the night sky. And I could definitely waste 10 minutes here. So, we've got one more thing to find. I feel very privileged to be at the Chelsea Flower Show when everybody has gone home. But the reason is, listen, you get sound, and I think that's got to be the third thing. We forget how much that adds to our garden. You listen, everything calms. When it comes to gardens, we chase that bigger picture, that idea of perfection. Was actually in reality, all we're looking for is a series of moments over 12 months. And as we go into the winter, there's days when the sound in our garden is incredibly crisp. So maybe just the sound of water outside the back door will help get you a little bit more over the coming months. It's been a year of unique highlights, and here's our team of gardening experts with their pick of the autumn show. My Chelsea highlight is seeing dailies at their very best. This is their time of year, and they look glorious on this display. I love the pop artist Lichtenstein, and I love this, the Pop Street Garden. The planting so saturated and vibrant. Being back here at Chelsea, this is how I feel. Mm, now, my favourite thing has to be David Dominey's My House Part Changed My Life exhibit. It's clearly explained, it's really interactive, and it's visual. For me, the standout thing has been the people. It's been so amazing to see so many happy, smiley people. My Chelsea highlight is these shaggy cows. They just make me smile. <laughs> My Chelsea highlight is the use of all these incredible boulders in so many of the gardens. Instead of pathways and seats, you have these huge monumental rocks. And some of them are even made of wood. For me this year, one of the true gems of Chelsea has to be the balcony gardens. We want more green spaces outside our back doors, don't we? We want to encourage wildlife into them, and those examples are exquisite. My Chelsea highlight has to be this wall, or possibly screen. It's beautiful, it's practical, it does a job. In fact, pretty much perfect. Heliopsis fire twister. It's got those gorgeous chocolatey leaves, perfectly set off, these ready orange flowers. Absolutely beautiful in the autumn garden. So that 
that's my Chelsea highlight. My Chelsea 2021 highlight is the use of water. From ponds and streams to aquatic plants, water is everywhere. My Chelsea highlight is this very quiet little planting. This little persicaria was one of the plants featured on the Wuhan garden in 2018. There were plants left over and it's been growing on and on ever since and been used again. It's a brilliant example of recycling. My Chelsea gem is on the China Guangzhou garden. It's a smaller cone-like structure sitting inside there. It's a wonderful corner of Chelsea. It's been my escape this week. My Chelsea gem is autumn. It's been great to see this show in a different season, to see different colours, to see different stars emerge. There's still plenty of life in a garden outside of spring and summer. My Chelsea highlight has to be Semponium Mrs Frosty. Yes, it's named after my wife. My highlight of Chelsea this year is Tom Massey's Yo Valley Organic Garden because of its inspirational environmental message. I love the focal point, which is the egg. My Chelsea highlight has to be near Tropic. I just feel like I've stepped aboard a spaceship's oxygen garden in a sci-fi film. Well, what a week we've had. We may have had to wait a long time for this one, but Chelsea 21 really has been special. What's been your standout moment or feature about it, Joe? Oh, it's, not, it's not a feature. I think it's just seeing everybody again. You know, every year we see these guys, they're, they're friends of ours. Being with the BBC crew as well, seeing the designers and the nursery men and women and everybody, it's just, it's the characters, the people that make this show. So it's not just one standout garden or plant for me. No, I mean, I, I, I think that's true. It's, n there's no one thing yeah. that has been that special. It's all been done. There's, there are two things that stood out for me. Is one, the atmosphere, and I know that that's a, a vague thing, but it has been different. It really has. There's been a much more benign. I mean, it's, it's almost as though everybody's just... This love drug has gone through and everyone's <laughs> feeling very happy. And the other thing is the way it's embraced the season. Yeah. And actually, you don't really get that in the May Chelsea so much. No. You know, no, it's... I mean, autumn's just a sort of passing thing in gardens. Yeah. And yeah. here it's been celebrating... Really and sort has. of pushed to, the, pushed to the fore. Yeah. Um, and we're all looking for plants because it's such a wonderful season. And I would love to see a big show in September from now on. I mean, September yeah. is a great time. Yeah. Now, Joe, I've got you a little present. Oh, I've got you a little present, Monson. Well, have you? Well, uh, this uh, uh, we have here, if I can find it. Oh, it's, here we are. It's not... It is little. So don't get too excited, oh, but it's a succulent. But it's lovely. a very special succulent. This. And I like aeoniums. Yeah. I might go have Sempervivum. This is a cross, the first cross between aeoniums and Sempervivum. OK. And it's called a Semponium. That makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the beauty of this, this is Semponium Siena, is that it's much hardier than aeonium. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks, has the same beauty, and it's very vigorous. And you should definitely be able to grow this outside in your London garden. Yeah, I think that's actually, I, I, you know, it says to be hardy down to about minus four, minus five. Yeah, and my wife's made, making lovely ceramic bowls, and we have quite a succulent collection. Well, there you are. But we haven't got that one, so lovely. Well, I've got you a present, Monty. Oh, you've got a big one. Yeah, look at this. <sighs> there you go. <laughs> a pot, Fantastic. and I know you don't have this grass, but you should. I can't grow this. My garden's too dry, and right. this likes the moisture, and it's a good shady grass, and it's Hakonoclea macra, right. and you've admired it, and a lot of gardens it, out there. And I can tell you something: I can give it moisture, <laughs> lots of moisture. Yeah, <laughs> and I know you haven't got that no. because you told me. Yeah. So it's a very thoughtful present for you as well, Monty. <laughs> good. Well, that really is almost it for this year. Don't forget to join myself and Sophie on BBC One tomorrow night at 6pm for our final look at this year's show. And, of course, we look forward to seeing you all again for another floral extravaganza in May next year. But until then, good night. Good night. <laughs>